the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Now, if that was me, it would be all right. But I'm talking about the King of Kings. I'm talking about the Lord of Lords. Come on, bless the name of Jesus. He's our rock. He's our fortress. He's our deliverer. And he's worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We exalt you. We magnify your name. There is none like you. You are worthy to be praised. We thank you for granting us traveling mercies, whether we drove, whether we flew, whether we uh, took a train, whether we hitched a ride with another saint. Thank you for bringing us safe over the highways, the airways, and the byways. Now, Father, I pray that you will bless us this evening. I pray for your anointing and power to be displayed. Father, I pray that your spirit will be present, that you will anoint my mouth, anoint our ears, that we might hear what thus saith the Lord. Father, I also ask that you will not only speak through me, but that you will also speak through Bishop Joseph Walker the third, who's not long from now, will also be preaching in Columbus, Ohio. Knowing that you are the same God that while you were nailed to the cross in a mighty and miraculous way, you were yet everywhere else in the universe. I'm thankful that there's enough of you to go around. So we say, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We pray this in the matchless and the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen, amen. Hey, it is good to be with you, saints. I count it a joy and privilege to, uh, to, to get the call uh, to preach to you this evening. I never take it lightly. It's always a blessing uh, to be able to share and to, uh, and, and to dive into the Word of God. Amen? I'm, I'm excited uh, because uh, while my mother died uh, several years ago, I believe in 2007, uh, I still have a ma. Amen. Uh, she is uh, my mother-in-law, uh, my wife's mother who was here. Uh, uh, ma, stand up. Along with, amen. First Lady Cynthia Tucker along with her sidekick, her traveling buddy, and my babe's godmother, uh, Sister Janice McGee. Amen. She's here also. Amen. So glad you are in the house. Uh, also, I see a couple of my members here, uh, Brother Joe and Diane Moody. Amen. Uh, wave at me. Amen. 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 Uh, brother, they deal with me because uh, uh, they, they, they know I love the Bears, even though I'm in Detroit. And so... Uh, um, I had been giving it to them for years, and they had a couple years that they've been giving it to me pretty hard too. And uh, right now we both down in the depth, so just pray for us uh, and pray our strength in the Lord. Amen. I'm going to ask that you will open up your Bibles with me, uh, for there is a word from the Lord to the Book of First Kings, the Book of First Kings, the Book of First Kings, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Amen. There you go. Amen. You had your help. Amen. When you find yourself at the book of 1 Kings chapter 17, uh, verse 7, if you'll stand, if you'll indicate that by standing uh, in honor and reverence of the word of the Lord, I greatly appreciate it. 1 Kings chapter 17, actually beginning at verse, um, at verse 8. Scripture reads, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, 
A widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. As you go to your seat, if you will help me introduce the title and text and subject uh, of today's sermon, turn to your neighbor and say, Neighbor, when God interrupts your pity party, you may have a seat in the presence of the Lord. When God interrupts your pity party, there are billions of things that we disagree over, especially during political season, just a billion things we disagree over. But uh, I believe that 99.98, because there's always a zero, a point zero two of us, that's a little strange. I believe that 99.98 of us can agree upon this. When you have laser-like focus on something, you hate to be interrupted. Uh, uh, can you agree with me? Anybody, I hate to be interrupted. Uh, you're taking some sort of, uh, uh, you're taking care of some sort of business or issue, big or small, important or not so important, and all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, without expectation, something or someone pushes you off your purpose, of, uh, off, the pur off your purpose path, and you find yourself interrupted. You're working on a project for work. You're focused on the task at hand. You're, you're, you're zoned in. You're clicking on all cylinders. Then in walks your boss with something that should have been taken care of two weeks ago. But, but, but now his, pro, his procrastination has turned into your emergency. And you have to drop what you're doing and take care of his stuff. You find yourself interrupted. You're home alone, so you decide to... Uh, to, to, to get a head start on a speech that you have to deliver on Monday. You're hammering away paragraph after paragraph, cleverly crafting and parsing phrases, but then you hear the garage door begin to open. With mixed emotions, you await the official announcement and conclusion of your study session. Honey, I'm home. Interrupted. You're watching your favorite show on TV, and, and it's been uh, uh, pre-recorded, and, and you, 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 you've DVR'd it, and, and you're sitting there on your couch, and, and you, you, you're, you're relaxing and watching your show when all of a sudden uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, news anchor comes on and says, breaking news, and tells you about something that you learned about three days ago. Interrupted. You've been traveling a, a familiar path on the way to work when, when all of a sudden you're met by a sea of red lights. A patch on the road that normally takes about 53 seconds to pass now takes 20 minutes. You end up late to work. Interrupted. You and your spouse you got the kids to bed. You're about to enjoy that gracious gift of God, the gift that God gave to man and married woman. When all of a sudden you hear the pitter patter of some feet and a knock on the door. Ma, you've been interrupted. Yes, yes, yes. When, when, when we are focused and have our minds set on certain things, it, it can be outrageously annoying. It can be high on the scale of bothersome. It can be very vexing when something or someone interrupts us. 
While this is the case, sometimes our laser-like focus isn't on things that are productive or peaceful. Sometimes our laser-like focus uh, isn't on obtainable goals. Sometimes our laser-like focus is on the fiascos of life. Sometimes our focus and fixation is, in our, is on our problems and our painful predicaments, and we find ourselves preoccupied with our own personal pity party. Anybody here know what it's like to throw a pity, a party of pity, and you're the only, and, and, and you have the audacity to invite no one but your own self? You're down in the dumps about your health, about your career, about your finances, about your family, about, about your singleness. You're down in the dumps uh, uh, about your uh, self perception or lack of opportunity. You're down in the dumps uh, uh, due to the death of a loved one. You're down in the dumps because someone, because, it, because now you have outlived most of your family members and friends and you're dealing with senior depression. You're down in the dumps because something happened to you that, 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 that not only was it not fair, it also wasn't even your fault. And now me, myself, and I, us three and not thee, are locked into a personal Pity party. But oh, this text demonstrates the fact that there are times when God Himself steps in and interrupts our personal pity party. Let's check out the text and see what happens when God does that. Uh, the, the context of our text today is the first six verses of 1 Kings chapter 17. Ahab was an evil king, an evil Israelite king who did more evil than his predecessors. The prophet Elijah came on the scene and announced uh, uh, Ahab and the nation's punishment. It would be neither do nor reign until Elijah, by God's command, declared it would be different. God had Elijah go and hide in the brook, in the brook carry there. Uh, God provided for Elijah naturally and supernaturally. During a drought, he was able to drink from the brook and had ravens bring him food and uh, meat in the morning and, and night and ravens taking care of him as if he were their baby. Then one day, watch this, by God's own timing, by God's own unannounced timing, the brook dried up. Something that once produced wasn't producing any longer. Something that once worked was no longer working. Uh, God, you, something that God used to bless Elijah yesterday wasn't going to bless him today. His brook dried up. But right when his brook dried up, God stepped in, stepped in and gave him a word. And if I could pause parenthetically, let me tell you, when you find yourself uh, dealing with a dried up brook, wait on a word from the Lord. Because once you get a word from the Lord, you'll have that which you need. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go at once to Zarephath, to the region of Sidon, and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So Elijah went to Zarephath. The widow in Zarephath will, will, re, will remain nameless tonight and for all history. As a widow, she's had to bury her, her, her husband. As a widow, she's had to bury her hope of, of living the good life. As a widow in ancient times, she, she had to bury her, her, her thoughts of security. She's poor. She's a single parent. She's charged with raising a child all by herself. Never getting a break. Every time the child cries, it's her responsibility. Every time the child comes home and needs money for a field trip, it's her responsibility. Every time the child gets in trouble, she's the one that has to leave work to go and take care of him. Never getting a break. On top of all this, she's been significantly impacted by something that has its root in another country. She's facing starvation because Ahab and old Jezebel been acting a fool. Are you with me? This widow who's been assigned by God to supply Elijah with food has no clue about her assignment. 
Not only is she unaware of God's direction and desire to use her, she's reached the point where she, where she has said, I'm at the end of my rope. I've done all that I can do. I've hoped and hoped and hoped and prayed and hoped and prayed some more. The writing is on the wall. It's time for me to check out of here. She's in the midst of a personal pity party. And truth be told, rightfully so. Have you been there? Impacted by poverty? Impacted by the death of a loved one? Left to care for your child all alone? Uh, uh, have to do things all by yourself have hope gone have, having to raise a child because somebody messed around and died on you have you ever been caught between the devil and the deep blue sea have you ever found yourself trying to survive and handle a problem you had no hand in creating in the midst of her personal pity party, just when she had given up, just when she had exhausted all options, just when she had exhausted all of her resources, God steps in and interrupts her. Uh, the end of the story is yet to be told, but let me tell you, I thank God that he can interrupt us in the nick of time. Uh, just when we've had all that we can take, just when we've took too many lickings, just when we wanted to throw in the towel, just when we were ready to, to, to take a knife across our wrist, just when we were ready to turn in our resignation, God came in. Yes. Made a difference in our lives. <laughs> Uh, God interrupts her through Elijah who himself is down and out and dealing with the blues. Remember, his brook had dried up. Uh, when Elijah, uh, God, 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 God interrupts her through, through, through Elijah. And so he follows the Lord's instructions and goes to Zarephath. When, he, when, when, when Elijah approached her at the gate, the widow was gathering a bunch of sticks. Elijah called to her and said, would, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I can have something to drink? And Reverend Malachi Walker, she turns and she was willing. It's been no dew or no rain for some years. Water is scarce. Elijah asked this widow, this woman who was already dealing with a broken situation, a woman he doesn't know for some water, and she obliges his request. Now, some would might suggest that he should thank his lucky stars and just leave this woman alone. But instead, he goes a little further. While she's going to get the water, Elijah calls to her again and says something like this. Oh, yeah, one more thing. While you're at it, bring me some water, bring me some bread, too. But the woman goes short, sir, look, as surely as your God lives, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and, and make one last meal for myself and for my son so that we can eat it and die. She's given up hope. She's at a place, she says, hey, I, one more meal, and I'm out of here. Now, one might expect uh, the prophet Elijah to say, oh, okay, thanks anyway. I, I'll pray that the, that, that the Lord in heaven above, that, 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 that the God of Israel will bless you and give you what you need. One might, might expect the, the prophet to say, listen, come here, let me lay hands on you, and I'm going to ask God to give you double for your trouble. But that's not what he does. Instead, Elijah says, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you said. But first, take a small, make a small loaf of bread for me. From, 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 from the little that you have, and bring it to me, and then make some for you and your son. Did, did you, did you? Did. She already gave him some water, and she didn't have to do it. You know, she could have said, listen, I ain't your waiter. I ain't your waitress. He has the audacity to say, hey, go home, go ahead, do that. But first, make me some bread. For I know you only got a little bit, but first make me some bread. Bring it to me, 
and then y'all go eat something. As I look on, uh, on my mind, uh, on the TV in my mind, I turn to a TV channel, uh, a cable, mind you, uh, a cable channel called HDS, High Definition Saint Division. And I can see this woman begin to look around to see if she's on candy camera. I can hear her say to Elijah, are your boys hiding behind a bush somewhere? Are you kidding me? Am I being punked? Is this a reality? Have I been set up? Are you playing with me? Permission to be real. Can you imagine what people would be saying? All, all the criticism that Elijah would face if he said this on the reality TV show called The Prophets of Israel. Can you imagine the tweets? Can you imagine the Facebook and Instagram post? Hashtag unbelievable. Instead of offering her a prayer and asking double for her trouble, instead of showing her some sympathy, this joker skips all the fact that she just said that her and her boy are about to eat their last meal and just go ahead and starve to death. This is why you can't trust them pimping prophets. Come on, come on. Can you picture it per, uh, uh, personally? It's a severe famine and, and you have enough for one last peanut butter and syrup sandwich for you and your child. And then Pastor Early shows up who you don't know from Adam and says, hey, give me half of it first. Feed me first. Watch this. Be, 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 before she could go off, like some of y'all would, before she could Elijah keeps talking before, but before he catches a sister girl. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends the rain. Yeah. Uh, watch this. Watch this. this wasn't a reality show. Uh, it was real life. It was a test of her sanity. It was a test of her faith. Remember, all she had was a little bit. Enough to make a little bread. This widow faithfully trusted the word of the Lord and, and, and did exactly what Elijah told her to do. And the word of the Lord proved true. Don't follow what you feel like. Don't follow uh, what, what, what you see on TV. Don't, don't follow what the newspaper tell you. Follow the word and instruction of the Lord. I have had it up to here with folks who will not simply do what the Bible says do. Falling out with folks and refuse to take their own deal with it. Marital problems and refuse to love each other and to submit to each other as it says in the word of God. Work on the word. That, was, that, that one was free. It wasn't even in the notes. Huh. Huh. Uh, 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 so, 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 so check this out. She trusted in the word of the Lord. Supernaturally, Elijah and, and her family were able to live off the flour and the jug of oil eating day in and day out just as the word of the Lord declared. Now, now, now what can this story teach us about God interrupting us? I'm so glad you asked. Huh. Lesson number one. When God interrupts our personal pity party, he comes with a promise. When God interrupts our personal pity party, he comes with a promise. In this case, the promise is that, food, is that the food will not run out until the rain comes. Watch this. The food will, will run out, but it won't run out until the appointed time. Come on, come on. Re -re Remember Elijah and his brook? The promised provision of the brook didn't dry up until it was time for it to dry up. 
Uh, until the point in time that God had predetermined that he would change the method of provision from brook and raven to flower and jug owned by the widow. Watch this, watch this. The supply was the brook and the raven. The supply was the flower and the jug. But the source was God. <laughs> I ain't got no help, doo-doo. <laughs> Uh, if my guess is right somebody came to the men and women's convention in St. Louis and, and you're at the end of your rope you can't see no way out you can't see no way through you don't know how you're going to make it and you've decided enough is enough you've decided to stop fighting you've decided to throw in the towel you've decided to accept the status quo you've decided that things will be the way they've always been but I'm here to prophesy in the name of our sovereign God that God is on the scene and he's ready to interrupt your personal pity party I'm here to prophesy that God is has a promise with your name on it you'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the field the fruit of your womb will be blessed you'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out the enemies will rise up against you will be defeated they'll come in one direction and leave in seven you will lend to many nations and borrow from none the Lord will make you the head and not the tail you'll live and not die and proclaim what the Lord has has done God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory high five your neighbor look him in the eye and say neighbor God's about to show up and show out in your life God has a promise for you if you will only obey well, 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 lesson number two, lesson number two, lesson number two, lesson number two, lesson number two. When God interrupts our personal pity party, his plans are bigger than our plans. His plans are bigger. His plans are larger than our plans. Uh, it reminds me uh, of the prophet Jeremiah. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You see, the, the, the widow's plan was for her and her son to eat one last meal and die. But God's plan was for her to eat every day. <laughs> Her plan was narrow, limited, and temporary, but God's plan was wide, unlimited, and enduring. Let me make it plain. Let me make it plain. Uh, uh, God's plan will always be an upgrade over what you have in mind. <laughs> ha, ha, listen, listen. I know back in the day Beyonce used to say she could upgrade you, but how many of you know can't nobody upgrade you like the Lord can? Can't nobody lift you up? Can't nobody give you what you need? Can't nobody upgrade you? Can't nobody take you from coach to first class like the hand of the Lord <laughs> I, I, I'm reminded of what the Lord declares uh, in Isaiah 55 my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are my ways your ways as the heavens are higher than the earth so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than yours I'm reminded of Saul Saul would have, been, would have been satisfied finding a donkey. But God wasn't satisfied until he made him king. Uh, you may be thinking about how you're going to pay one bill when God is looking to bless you with a job and sufficient income to take care of all your bills. You're stressing out about how you're going to pay rent, but God's plan is not only to give you rent money, but to fix your spending habits, teach you how to save and not get everything that you want so that you can mess around and have a home with your name on it. 
You've been, comp- you've been contemplating compromising to keep your boyfriend, but God's plan is to kick that joker to the curb in order to give you a husband and a holy household. <laughs> <laughs> You've been focused on just getting out of high school, but God has a PhD with your name on it. You're, you're, you're worried about your kids getting saved, but God's mind is already on the ministry of your grandkids. You're just trying to spiritually survive until Sunday, but God has planned to make you worthy of his salvation. Worthy of the calling that's on your life. God's plans are bigger than your plans. Well, well, well. Hasten on lesson number three. Lesson number three, when, when, when God interrupts our personal pity party, he wants to give us the good stuff. <laughs> when God interrupts our personal pity party, he wants to give us the good stuff. If we're honest, we have to admit on the surface, it seems like tough stuff. For this widow to be told to give from the little that she has. You want me to not only give from my little, you want me to make you first, make yours first? What if I run out? Why should I share when I don't have a shareable amount? Come on, Pastor, you're, you're, you're familiar with, why should I tithe when I don't make tithing money? The devil is a lie. Instead of giving into this kind of thinking, the widow trusted the word of the Lord. She gave and she was blessed because of it. The question I need to pose right here is this. What if the widow didn't do as instructed to do? What if she didn't share? What if she wasn't willing to sacrifice? What if she was only willing to take care of numero uno herself? What if she didn't bless the man of God? What if if she said, I'd rather die than give away my baby's food? What if she said, like some of us may say, I got mine. You better figure out how you're going to get yours. Let me suggest that if she had not seized the opportunity to express faith and obedience, she and her son would have had one last meal and died. Saints, what opportunities have you missed because you had a tight grip instead of an open hand towards God? What what opportunities have you missed because you've had a tight hand towards other people? Where would you be? If that one time you let go and let God. (laughs) We, we, We need to remember God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. We need to remember the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In other words, God owns everything in the universe. God doesn't need anything from you and he don't need nothing from me. You don't give your time and your resources. You don't tithe and give offering because God needs it to make the world or the church go around. We don't give thinking that we're helping God. We give because God has been good to us. We give because it's a blessing to obey. thing I'm trying to convey is this. When God requires something of you, even when that something is helping somebody else out from your little, it's not for his benefit, it's for yours. He's trying to give you the good stuff. Saints, the Spirit is saying, bring me your flower. Bring me your oil. Bring me your tithe. Bring me your offering. Bring me your sacrificial contribution. Bring me your talents and spiritual gift. Bring me 30 minutes of your day. Bring me an hour and a half of the week to study beside your brothers and sisters the word of God. Bring me your willingness to serve. Bring me your innovative abilities. Bring me your 
lost flickering love for each other. Bring me your brokenness. Bring me your near empty checkbook. Bring me the broken yet salvageable marriage. Bring me your shattered dream. Bring me your corrupted career. Bring me your troubled neighborhoods. It may not seem like much in your hands, but when you put it into the hands of the master, When you take your little bit and you put it in the hand of the Lord, he can make much out of your morsel. So just ask the little boy who had a couple fish and five loaves of bread. Jesus took this boy-sized lunch and fed 5,000 men plus women and children. Uh, point number four as I hasten to get to my seat. When God interrupts our, pity, our personal pity party, he may be setting us up to not only be blessed, but be a blessing. In this supernatural provision, God took care of two people at one time. Think about it. Elijah has spoken truth to power, and now that power is trying to kill him, so he's had to hide out by the brook Harris. Eventually his brook dries up. What used to work no longer works no more. Put another way, Elijah has the blues. The Lord sends him to a widow woman, and he asks for her help. Come on now. You, you, you know how the saints are. <laughs> when we're stuck between a rock and a hard place, we, we don't want to tell nobody. We don't want to ask nobody for nothing. Some of us have purchased too much of the American dream, I mean, the American fantasy. <laughs> that if you work hard enough, if you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, you'll be okay. But how many of you know <laughs> that it's impossible to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps when you don't have boots? Sometimes, washed by the blood of the Lamb, saved, sanctified, loving the Lord, ministering amongst his people, we can still find ourselves needing to depend on the saints of God. Amen. This widow woman has her own set of issues. She only has a little bit of bread to eat and she's given up. Let's be real. Folks, folks, folks will hardly want to help you when they got something. They shown up. Somebody say shown up. <laughs> they shown up don't want to help you when they only got a little. But when, but, but, but when God stepped in, he interrupted both their pity parties. Elijah ate, the woman ate, and her son ate. God brought them together and killed two, bird, killed, killed two birds with one stone. Okay, okay, okay. I'm ready to hit on the theme right here. When, when you add Elijah's blues and you, when you add the, the, the widow's bantam bread and then put God in the equation, miracles can happen. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor, say, neighbor, if God is in the picture, something can happen when blues meets bread. Something can happen when blues meets bread. What are you trying to say, preacher? My God is so good. He can take somebody who is down and out because their brook has dried up and send them to someone else who has experienced death and famine and hopelessness and use them to be a blessing to each other. Yes, yes, yes. It turns out we're better together. We're better together. Is there anybody in the house who can say, I'll bring my blues, you bring your bread, we'll trust God together and watch God work it out. Is there anybody here that has some blues? Is there anybody here that has some bread? Is there anybody here that has some struggles, that has some issues, that has some hardship? Is there anybody here 
one that has a dollar? Is there anybody here that has three quarters? Is there anybody here that has a couple of dimes? Is there anybody here that has some experience? Do you have some connections? If you get together, if I get with you, and you get with me, God can, God shall work it out when we're together. Is there a witness in the house that can say, thank God, I don't have to go in alone. Thank God, I don't have to do this by myself. Thank God, I don't have to do this by me, by myself, and myself alone. I don't have to deal with depression alone. I don't have to deal with poverty alone. I don't have to deal with low resources alone. I don't have to deal with disappointments alone. But God has given me some brothers and sisters to go through this journey with me. I'm glad God has washed me in his blood, but he's also cleansed some other people so that we can get together and we can face anything. We can face any obstacles. We can be up and we can be down while we're together. Together, we are better. Thanks when you swallow your pride and lean on another brother or sister. Saints, when we open, when we're open and honest with each other, and admit we need some help, when we're willing to sacrifice and use the resources that God gives us, not only to take care of our needs but our needs, God can, God will step in and interrupt you. When we get together, God will interrupt your heartbreak with a hallelujah. God will interrupt your sorrow with a song of victory. God will interrupt your suffering with some shouts. God will interrupt your troubles with some testimony. God will interrupt your pain with his praise. God will interrupt your gloom with his glory. I know what he can do. I know that God can work it out. Yes, yes, yes. Your brook may have dried up. Your brook may have dried up. Your back may be up against the wall. You may have already tossed in the towel, but our God can interrupt you. Our God can intervene. Our God can make a way out of no way. Our God can turn things around. Won't it will? Won't it make a way? Won't it fix it? Won't it give you what you need? Won't it heal your body? Won't it fix it? Won't it forgive you? Won't it deal with it? Won't it strengthen you? Won't it work it out? I know he's all right. Watch this, watch this. We might as well work together. Our spiritual journey a walk with the Lord begins at the cross. How many of you know when you met Jesus at the cross, there were already others who had met him before you? In the beginning of our Christian journey, there's the cross and other people. Then, when this thing is over, The word says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ shall rise. And we, we who remain 
shall be caught up and meet him in the air out the door with this notion that we're going to take solo flights into heaven out the door that you're going to meet Jesus all by yourself no if you get to heaven you're going to do you're going to do it with all of us oh they used to sing about it they used to say when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing it will be when we when we all see Jesus we will sing we will shout we will sing sing we will shout shout we will sing 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 and shout 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 the victory but is there anybody here that knows you don't have to wait until it's over you can shout right now praise him because he can help you praise him because he sent somebody along your way praise him because he's worthy praise him because he's good praise him because he can work it out I know, I know, I know, I know, I know that he's all right. Say it. Together, 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 we can do it. Together, we can fix this. Together, we can wage war against the enemy. Together, we can cast demons out. Together, we can take back our communities. Together, we can protect our kids. Together, we can be the church of the living God. Together, together, together. When God interrupts your pity party, sometimes he does it through some other saints. And if we'll just open ourselves up, he can do it. Sometimes he assigns us to help other people. Come on, come on, come on. When you understand that God's assigned you to help other people, it can cause you to look at other people differently. You can say, I got thousands because you got hundreds and God wants me to bless you. My business is prospering because you don't have a job, but God wants me to bless you. It can cause you to look at people differently. Yes, I came to, to declare that God is in the room and he's ready to interrupt your pity party. I wonder if there's anyone who wants to pray tonight. Remembering that when God steps in, he comes with a promise. Be encouraged. When God comes in, his plans are bigger than your plans. Let, let your stuff go. Take his thing. When God steps in, he wants you to give you the good stuff. Trust the Lord. Even when it doesn't make sense. Even when the numbers don't add up. When God steps in, he may be fixing you. So in the process, he can fix somebody else. I wonder if there's anybody here to say, hey, I heard the word. I got some stuff to pray about. I got some commitments. I want you to just come and begin to make